Good evening. Uh, Tonight's Bible reading comes from Psalm chapter 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed. They will turn back in sudden disgrace. This is God's word. Um, Earlier this year, we, at Lawson Baptist, we did a short series on laments. Um, It had just come to my attention that while some of us begin the year with great enthusiasm, and right now in our own home, our kids have been eagerly poring over the emails that tell them what their timetables are and which teachers they've got, and there's a great sense of anticipation and excitement about that. But for other folks, um, the new year um, doesn't bring um, rosy skies, it brings difficulty. It brings the same difficulty that the year before brought. And for some of us, our prayers can take on a very optimistic and praiseful tone. But for others of us, our prayers um, become persistent cries out to God for mercy. And so it was really with that in mind um, that we did spend a few weeks looking at lament, and that's where um, this psalm has come from. Um, Just let me pray to ask God to help us understand. Uh, wonderful, loving Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God, and we thank you that we can hear your voice clearly through your words. We ask that you would enable us by your Spirit to hear you, just to put everything else out of our minds just for this minute, and we just pray, dear Father, that you would turn our eyes this evening toward Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, three weeks before the beginning of the 2021 Ashes, on the 19th of November, the then Australian cricket captain, Tim Payne, dropped a bombshell. Tim Payne, on that day, resigned as captain of the Australian men's cricket team. Now, Tim Payne had, up until that point, played a really important part in the repair of the image of the Australian men's cricket team after the debacle of South Africa and the sandpapering the ball episode. But now it came out that he, who had done so much good, was himself responsible for really tarnishing the image of Australian cricket. At his short press conference, it lasted just for a couple of minutes. He took no questions. He really, quite remarkably, admitted to his mistakes. He took full personal responsibility for his actions. He apologised to his wife, to his children. He apologised to Cricket Australia, to the broader Australian cricket community, and also to the other party. His tears flowed. He took regular pauses. His voice broke. On national TV, 
he was undone. He went from being perhaps the second most important person in Australia, the captain of the Australian men's cricket team, to never playing for Australia again. Um, in that moment, his life changed forever. Now, sometimes our lives are marked by sharp, profound episodes of grief and despair. They are moments that stick in our minds and they shape us forever. Now, our moments of grief and shame are not likely to be nearly so public as Tim Payne's, but they will hurt just the same. And so perhaps as you just reflect on Psalm 6, perhaps as you reflect on that psalm, you can think of a time where you had to ask somebody forgiveness, for forgiveness. Perhaps you can remember a time when you let your spouse down. Perhaps you know what it feels like to be sacked from a job. When you think about your own life or even uh, just look at the lives of your very closest friends and family, um, we observe what it's like to go through deep trauma. We observe what it's like um, when a relationship breaks down, when a debilitating illness um, changes life, when there's personal failure or financial mismanagement or when there are addictions. All of these things can bring uh, tremendous grief to our lives. Now, the Bible doesn't avoid the hard subjects. The Bible doesn't give us rose-coloured glasses with which to look at life. Um, Israel's great poet was David, King David. He was a person of immense faith. He, was, he had a very tender heart. He was a very talented musician. He wrote and composed beautiful poetry and songs. David was also a violent warrior, and he was a cunning um, political player. He knew um, how to work things for his own advantage. And so we see that David was a person who was capable of both horrible sin, but also of beautiful and humble repentance. David writes Psalm 6 from a place of personal calamity. Um, it's with a deep awareness of his own brokenness. It's with a deep awareness of his own faults and sins that he cries out to God. And so just to help us in our own moments of grief and despair, to help us process those moments, we're just going to look at Psalm 6 very briefly. And from that psalm, we're going to draw three uh, important principles. And so the first of those principles is this, that in the middle of personal calamity, David complains honestly. In the middle of personal calamity, David complains honestly. Now, David's situation is bad. He calls out to God in this psalm. He complains that God's anger and God's wrath are being uh, expressed from heaven against him. He says there in verse 2 that he feels faint, that his bones are in agony. The psalmist has flooded his bed with tears, and unfortunately that hasn't made it onto the slide, but if you look there, um, he, the psalmist's bed is flooded with tears and his couch is drenched. Now, I take those metaphors to mean that he has really cried a lot. He's really upset. He says his, um, he says his eyes are worn out from groaning. I'll just see, I, I have got it there. His eyes are worn out from groaning and he's oppressed by his foes to the point of breaking. Now, the picture, the picture that we are given here is one of ongoing distress. We are given a picture 
of some kind of deep, ongoing personal trial. Something is breaking the psalmist here. It's breaking him physically and emotionally and spiritually. Now, just a week ago, all through the world news was reports of Jacinta Ardern's teary resignation. Now, Jacinta Ardern was widely considered to be a strong and compassionate leader. She navigated her country through some extremely difficult periods, COVID, of course, but also that volcanic eruption in New Zealand and also the shootings at the mosques. She navigated her country through some um, incredibly difficult periods. But she said over time, the online trolling, the relentless pressure of the political system, the toll that that took on her partner and young child, she said that it all just became too much. She was exhausted. She said she didn't have enough in the tank to keep going. She couldn't do it anymore. It was just time, she said. And so with red eyes and tears, she resigned. With red eyes and tears, she finished. Sometimes life just breaks people. It's just more than they can bear. Psalm 6 gives Christians permission to cry out to God when things are hard. And Psalm 6 gives us a kind of language that we can use to express the feelings that are going on in our hearts. Now, many theologians wonder what was the circumstance that lay behind this psalm. Sometimes in the psalms, we're given a little um, narrative clue that gives us a clue to um, what was happening in the life of the psalmist. But in this case, um, we don't have that. And so some theologians have looked at this psalm, well, historically even. Historically, this has been considered to be a psalm of penitence. It's the psalm of a person whose heart is overcome with a sense of their own um, sin. They're grieved by what they've done, and they're calling out to God. Um, But others have looked at this psalm, and all through it, they've noticed the language of body, all through references to, to the body. And so they've wondered if what was really going on behind this psalm was some kind of deep, ongoing, um, painful, debilitating illness. And still others have looked to verse 9 with the reference to foes, and they've wondered that if perhaps what the best explanation for this very emotional cry out to God is actually persecution. It's um, persecution um, to the faithful people. We are naturally curious about it, because we're actually a people in you know, our very analytical Western minds, we love to diagnose things. We love to be able to say what is happening and why we draw inferences, we make conclusions. We are strongly wired to think about cause and effect. We always want to know why is this happening? Why? These are questions that we ask ourselves. Why do we find ourselves in relational difficulty? Why do we find ourselves so anxious? What is the reason um, that we're in financial hardship? Why do people inexplicably fail us? Or why do um, situations come our way completely outside of our control? Um, Maybe you say, why do my kids do what they do? Or maybe we look back into the past and we say, why did our parents do this with us? Or maybe you're a young person and you're sitting here and you're thinking, why are my parents doing what they're doing? We love to diagnose, we love to analyse, and we love to blame. We love to have somewhere to put the blame. But really, Psalm 6 doesn't help us very much here because it's ambiguous. It's not really clear what type of calamity has come upon the psalmist or why it's happening to him. And in a way, this ambiguity is helpful because it means it makes the language useful to us, whatever the situation is that we're crying out to God in. It means that Psalm 6 is useful in different situations. If we feel especially repentant or conscious of our own sin, this psalm gives us language to call out to God. 
Um, if we feel attacked by people around us and there is increasing hostility towards um, Orthodox Christian beliefs, this psalm is useful for talking to God. Um, this psalm is useful if we battle illness or feel sick. The ambiguity in this psalm is also helpful because it helps, takes, it helps um, take our mind away from the question of what and why, and it helps move us toward the question of who. Who can help us? We don't know why things happen, and we may never know, but we do know who we can turn to for help. And so this really brings us to the second aspect of um, Psalm 6 that we're going to look at in the inexplicable personal calamity of Psalm 6, in that moment of terrible personal suffering, the psalmist prays to God and asks for mercy. Now, the psalmist, um, the psalmist in his distress talks to God. His reaction, his response to calamity is to pray. He doesn't look to people to blame. He doesn't self-soothe with alcohol. He doesn't even make a to-do list of all the things that might start to turn this situation around. The psalmist begins by asking God directly um, not to rebuke him or discipline him in his wrath. Now, this verse is just interesting because when we read Hebrew, Hebrew poetry, we don't read rhymes, we never read rhyming words, but, um, which is useful since we're not reading it in Hebrew, but um, Hebrew poetry usually works by rhyming ideas, and so this is a really good example of that. You can see there's a real symmetry there in those verses. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. In verse 2, um, the psalmist prays to God, asking for healing and for mercy. In verse 4, he asks for deliverance. There is a real simplicity to these requests. The psalmist is saying, stop being angry, God. Stop being angry, and instead of anger, give me mercy and grace. Instead of anger, show me favour. The psalmist is saying, stop this, God, turn this around, deliver me from calamity. I really, really want this to end. And what we see in this psalm is it's not a fast prayer on the fly. This is not like the kind of prayer that, you know, we sometimes pray, please, you know, um, help me find a car space or the queue's really long and we're really keen to get to the front because we've got somewhere else to be. Um, this is not a fast or flippant prayer. Psalm 6 is a prayer fermented over time with tears. It's written out. It's memorized. Um, it's a prayer that people, rather than carrying their huge scroll of psalms around with them, would have had memorized. It was something available to recall. Psalm 6 is a lament that comes from the psalmist's commitment to both prayer and to believing in God's power to act. In, psalm, in verse 4, the psalmist says, Lord, save me because of your unfailing love. Now, the basis for his request there is, his, the basis of his request for mercy is not his own merit, it's not because he considers himself to be an innocent party. It's not because he's suffered injustice. He's not praying, vindicate me, God, because I am good. His prayer is something um, much more simple. The psalmist is saying, do something, God, because you are faithful and that's your character. You are a God of love. Act in accordance to your character, your faithful character. The hope of the psalmist in the midst of this uncertainty, in the middle of the unanswerable questions, the hope of the psalmist is in the things that he knows to be true about God. The lament is not animated by the question of why 
the unanswerable why, the question, the lament is animated by the question of who. Pain has a way of waking us up to our need for God. It reminds us the calamities that come along our way in life, they just remind us that we are actually quite powerless. We are not in control of our lives, and there are questions that we have that have no answers. They may never have any answers. And so, just remembering that powerlessness and just remembering that God is a sovereign God, those ideas energize our prayer. And so, in this way, our prayers are more than requests. When we turn to God in trouble, it's not just an ask for help. The prayer itself is a statement that we believe there is a God who can act, that He is the great helper. By, just by praying, we are making a statement of faith. It's a statement that in our own uncertainty that we do believe there is a God who can act. Lastly, in Psalm 6, in that space between, in that space between the tears and the asking, the psalmist chooses to trust. And so really this psalm, for all of this quite dramatically emotional language of despair and pain and suffering, it really has quite an astonishing end. And so, even though the psalmist's bed is flooded with tears and his couch is drenched, um, even in spite of these things in verse 8, the psalmist says that the Lord has heard his weeping. In verse 9, um, in verse 9, he says, the Lord accepts my prayer. And in verse 10, he states his confidence that his enemies will be overcome. And so, in that difficult space between feeling intensely the pain of our disappointments and griefs, and in between that pain and praying for deliverance, the, psalm tr the psalmist trusts in God's goodness and God's character, trusting that God will act. Now, Psalm 6 doesn't tell us what happens in the end. We don't know um, how God acted. We have no idea how this story ends or what was the consequence of the praying. But the prayer still makes a difference. The psalmist assumes, even before that he's seen anything, that God hears, accepts and commits to do something. And so, the result of the prayer is that the psalmist has a new confidence. Um, it may be that the psalmist has to keep coming back and praying that psalm, that lament over and over again. It may be that he never um, has the blessing of seeing um, an answer in the way that he wanted. But in that space between tears, in the space between tears and asking, he will keep trusting. And it's really in this way that Psalm 6 it is not an act of self-pity. The lament, with all of its um, metaphoric and dramatic language, um, is not an act of self-pity. It's a prayer in, prayed in pain that leads to trust. That's what a lament is. It's a prayer prayed in pain that leads to trust. Now, um, author Mark Vrogop I haven't got that quote. Author Mark Vrogop, who's written a very important work on lament. It's called, <clears throat> excuse me, it's called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, if you want to look for it, Mark Vrogop. This is what he says. He says, laments are not cul-de-sacs of sorrow, but bridges that lead to God's character. So maybe you come here this evening with a heavy heart, you feel exhausted, you come, you gather in the presence of your brothers and sisters, you have questions that have no answers. There is pain but no end in sight. For some, the year begins with optimism but not for you. Um, 
if that is the key that you come in tonight, then the, the words of this lament are for you. And here are just three short ways that we can practically respond um, to this lament. The first thing that we can be doing is simply to pray. Pray your laments to God. Now, Psalm 6, it's just a short psalm. It's just 10 verses. It's a deeply personal, it's a deeply personal and relational psalm from somebody that prays um, to a God who listens. Now, Jesus said that we are not heard. The Father doesn't listen to us on the basis of our many words. And so a lament can be prayed. It only needs to be short. Psalm 6 gives us really an excellent pattern for lamenting, complaining honestly, asking boldly, choosing to trust. Um, at church, I encouraged folks who, for whom this passage really resonated to write out a lament, and I was sent some truly you know, heartbreaking laments, people whose hearts break for situations that have no obvious answer, but in that brokenness still turn out to God choosing to trust. Um, there's an application for us here to be people who pray, to be people who pray and to make the words of this psalm our own. The second way that we can respond to this psalm is to repent honestly. There is a tendency, I think, to really look towards... I mean, we look around our world and we see a world of negativity. And so in there's, there's a good sense in which the positivity of Jesus, we're drawn to that. Um, I was reading a blog... A blog recently that was just noting the way that in comfortable Christianity, though, there can be a tendency for us to gravitate towards positive stories of Jesus and avoid, wherever possible, any messages about sin or judgment. And if we do this for long enough, we do eventually find ourselves following a Jesus who we deserve um, with a hell or punishment that's reserved for people really quite unlike us. Um, this is a kind of spiritual poverty that strangles our praying. And somebody that falls into this kind of position will never ever be able to pray Psalm 6 with a heart breaking to the Lord um, and with a deep awareness of their own limitations and guilt. Um, it might be worth reflecting um, how our own prayers compare in the depth um, to Psalm 6. Um, the last application that I'll just draw from Psalm 6 is this. Pray personally for each other. There is a remarkable spiritual transfer of confidence when one grieving Christian who can barely manage even the words to pray um, has a brother or sister come alongside of them and pray personally, um, lamenting for the situation in which they find themselves. <clears throat> um, when, when we arrived in Bolivia in 2007, in the May of 2007, Kate was seven months pregnant. And, um, you know, in the July of that year, quite early, Lily was born, and Lily spent the first couple of days of her life in the neonatal intensive care unit, and the doctors just didn't know what was going on, and we didn't know what was going on, and you can imagine for a young mother in a, the developing world, in a place where, you know, she had a useful but certainly not um, perfect use of the language, that was a very horrifying situation to be in, um, that lady there, Totti, she, I remember her clearly as anything, sitting in the hospital hallway with Kate. I was praying, you could imagine, the most um, desperate prayers, but Totti just sat next to her and held her hand and cried with her. And 
um, it was that moment of entering into her grief, not rushing, not rushing to say, Romans 8, 28, it's going to be okay, um, not rushing to say unhelpful things in the midst of your difficulty, you know, it may be that your baby's died, but maybe many people will come to Jesus. We hear all kinds of crazy stuff offered by Christians, well-meaning Christians, and in one sense, speaking the truth, there is a, a truth that our wonderful Lord brings wonders even from disaster, but um, there's a very important step that is sharing each other's grief. Before we rush to um, before we rush to requests and choosing to trust. That was a particularly difficult situation. Um, you know, that's not the kind of thing that we find ourselves in all the time. Um, just, just in December, I, all of the little churches in the mountains, there's a small, well, a, a, you know, a, a Anglican church a little larger than Lawson Baptist, and then two smaller churches, a Presbyterian church and a uniting church, and we got together in the mid-mountains um, to put on you know, a Christian carol service, and it was just a chaotic kind of event that our church, for different reasons, kind of ended up organising, um, and, you know, in the minutes before, I had five minutes to get up and speak to this um, you know, much larger group than we were expecting. I had five minutes to talk about the incarnation. And just my mind was, there was a thousand things that were going through my mind and I felt very uncomposed, very lacking in composure. And uh, uh, just a couple from church, a brother and sister put their hands on me and prayed for me. And in the minute where, in just in that moment where my own composure was kind of gone, I was able to draw from their composure, a brother and a sister praying, praying for me in that kind of moment, but also praying resolutely to the Lord in whom they believed. And it's a remarkable thing when, you know, maybe in your, not in your strongest moment, but somebody um, grounded and trusting draws alongside of you. There's an amazing transfer of spiritual confidence from one prayer to another. To exhort a friend to keep hoping without lamenting with them in their pain is actually a way of invalidating their suffering. It's a type of pastoral care that says, you should be happy and hopeful without saying, we lament with you because this isn't what you were made for. The language of lament and praying prayers of lament is a remarkably powerful uh, tool of pastoral care. And, um, you know, you just never know when it will be you in that moment with somebody in their despair. And so, uh, I think there's an encouragement from Psalm 6. Be familiar with the language and prayer of lament. I'm just going to finish with this quote. Um, it's not, that's all right. I'm going to read you this quote. This is what it says. Um, the best solace, this is from Tremper Longman III, who is a very well-known Old Testament commentator. This is what he says. The best solace we offer to one another is not to explain away the pain, but to acknowledge its reality. We can hold up to one another our own experiences of divine grace within the continuing reality of suffering that marks our daily lives. The pain has not gone away, but God and His grace have become even more real to each of us as we acknowledge that God's will for us is not suffering and death, but abundant life, lived in the light shining out of the darkness." Let me pray. Wonderful Jesus, you know us better than we even know ourselves. And you know how each one of us comes before you this evening. Uh, when we look around our world and at our own lives, there are things that make our hearts break and it's really hard. 
these moments are really hard, Jesus. Please help us to keep trusting in you. Amen.